Good afternoon. It's uh, truly a pleasure to welcome you to the um, inaugural event of the Zell event series. Freedom of expression is the core value of the University of Chicago. It resonates throughout the history of the university, and it's a principle that has long distinguished us and which enables us to provide the education, the transformative education that we do to our students and to be a place that has the possibility of creating entirely new and unexpected ways of thinking. In its most essential form, freedom of inquiry drives rigorous scholarship, the results of which form a natural pathway to answering the deepest questions and addressing some of the greatest challenges of society. Our commitment to cultivating the best ideas and answering the deepest questions can only succeed if we as an institution are proudly, even fiercely, open to outstanding students and scholars from the greatest range of backgrounds, perspectives, and experiences. In this way, freedom of expression and diversity, inclusion, and belonging mutually reinforce one another. At a time when there are more channels for speech than ever before, it is critical that we think deeply about how to ameliorate the deficits of listening and deliberation that frequently suffuse intellectual and societal discourse. If we are to position ourselves as staunch advocates and defenders of free expression, it's also imperative that the university dedicate itself to constantly reflecting upon the state of free expression on campus and beyond. This is work that we will undertake with you today. We may even have some disagreements. <laughs> this event was made possible by the tremendous generosity of Helen and Sam Zell. They are unable to join us in person today, but I do invite you to join me in thanking them for championing the very worthy work of advancing academic freedom and freedom of expression on our campus and beyond. I'd now like to turn it over to Tom Ginsburg. Tom is the Leo Spitch Distinguished Service Professor of International Law, the Ludwig and Hilde Wolf Research Scholar, and Professor of Political Science here at the university. Tom is an eminent scholar and thinker on the constellation of these issues related to free expression and constitutional law and many other matters. So please join me in welcoming Tom. Thank you, Paul, and thanks to everyone for coming today. Uh, I think the, the turnout is a reflection of the sense that we have, many of us, that academic freedom, that free expression are very fraught in our current moment. In universities, we have you know, cancellations, we have hecklers, vetoes, we have professors being fired, we have students being bullied, um, and we're not alone. Many other countries in the, around the world face the same kind of challenges. Uh, in many other countries, the state plays a, a very significant role in shaping and constraining environments for academic inquiry. Uh, so this is what I hope will be the first of many events where we wrestle with these issues in order to deepen our own commitments to free expression and to think about exactly uh, where we can go and how we, in fact, might start a conversation internally but also externally. And so it's a really great honor to have the first speaker be Anthony Julius. Anthony is a uh, British super lawyer, I think would be the phrase. He's a professor at University College London uh, who's argued many uh, major cases, most uh, notably for our purposes, um, the case of Irving v. Penguin Books, which was a, a defamation brought, lawsuit brought by the Holocaust denier David Irving against Penguin Books and the Holocaust scholar Deborah Lipstadt 
uh, which was made into a film, some of you may have seen, a film called Denial. Uh, but in that case, his role was to, in a courtroom, challenge the academic pseudo-evidence that had been brought by David, David Irving. Um, he works very broadly on a large number of topics, including a book um, on T.S. Eliot, Anti-Semitism in Literary Form. Uh, he's working on a book now on the censorship of art. And most notably, for our purposes, has just published an article called Willed Ignorance, Reflections on the David Miller Case, a case involving a, a British uh, academic who was um, um, removed, I guess I would say, which was published recently in Current Legal Problems. So um, it's wonderful to have you here, and thank you for joining us, Anthony. Uh, in response, uh, we have my colleague Genevieve Lakier, who is uh, the professor of law and the Herbert and Marjorie Freed teaching scholar at the University of Chicago Law School. She holds a PhD in anthropology from our um, department and a JD from NYU Law School. Um, I will brag that she is one of the country's leading thinkers on the First Amendment on, on the role of social media, and has, her work is cited extensively in a very important case, uh, which you will probably all soon hear of, uh, involving a Texas bill which requires internet companies to have, be content neutral in their regulation. Um, and thus, in terms of takedowns, they can't, can't be politically biased, a very major and important case which will shape, I think, the future of the Internet here in the United States. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to call Antony up. Uh, what the format will be that Antony will give some opening remarks, and Genevieve and I will then um, you know, comment. And then I hope quickly to open it up so that we can have a very broad conversation in true University of Chicago style. Uh, and without further ado, Antony, thank you. I almost silenced myself by my own incompetence. <laughs> the only kind of silencing which is excusable, perhaps. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Tom, and thank you very much, uh, uh, President, for uh, the invitation to come here. It's a, just a tremendous pleasure and a privilege for me. Chicago has always been, in my mind, a very special place from when I was a young adult. I associated it with uh, uh, with Saul Bellow and Alan Bloom, and that's just the bees. Um, it, it, Chicago is the bees' knees for me. Um, I, and it's a tremendous uh, honor, really, uh, to be invited to speak um, and to share some thoughts about academic freedom, um, thoughts which are somewhat at a slant, perhaps, to Chicago's position, but I think uh, uh, by perhaps related processes of reasoning arrive at pretty much the same position in, I suspect, most cases. Um, I've, this, is the, this is the fifth event uh, that I've spoken at um, since I arrived here on Sunday. And um, my, my, I, I say that without any complaint at all. On the contrary, um, it's just been the most wonderful uh, experience for me, um, particularly since I came to Chicago as much to learn as to expound. Um, I mean, as a general rule of thumb, what I try to do is to ensure that I speak for half the time that I listen. And then I find there are opportunities for me to leave the engagement having learned something. And what I've heard in Chicago over the last four days has enriched me to the point at which every evening I've gone home and written up and revised and I'm afraid to say in several cases scored out much of what I'd already written in draft on a whole range of topics. So again, thank you um, for that. The robust exchanges which I enjoyed starting at the terrifying round table in the law school on Monday, which left me weak at the knee and um, despairing, um, through to the more informal exchanges I've had with Tom and other colleagues um, have actually left me feeling slightly jealous that um, so much that's taken for granted here is beyond reach in so many other institutions, including on occasion, I'm afraid to say, um, my own. Now, what I have to say um, this evening um, it really is a gloss, and no more than a gloss, 
on uh, former university uh, president Hannah Hilburn Gray's statement of position um, set out in, in the university's, this university's report of the Committee on Freedom of Expression, which I read with tremendous interest when preparing um, for this evening's um, event. What uh, she said uh, uh, is as follows. Universities should be expected to provide the conditions within which hard thought and therefore strong disagreement, independent judgment, and the questioning of stubborn assumptions can flourish in an environment of the greatest freedom. And of course, bravo to that. I, I note in passing um, how very many uh, value judgments as to quality of work and range of topic um, are built into that statement. My own contributions um, in Chicago this week have been to challenge assumptions about how art might best be defended and how academic free speech, the, the, the very distinct discourse academic speech, distinct from, for example, religious speech or political speech, how academic free speech might best be conceptualized. Um, and um, I am indeed across the range of uh, free speech questions that burden us all these days, locally and personally, most concerned with academic free speech and art free speech. These concerns have pointed me towards the need to disaggregate what we may term the liberal theory of free speech. Um, it is best understood, I think, as a family of theories of free speech, with a distinct version for each of the main discourses that together make up our social world. Religious speech, commercial speech, political speech, and so on. What is permitted in political speech, vote for this, is not permitted in commercial speech by this, for example. Academic speech, likewise, is a distinct discourse. Learn this. And it has its own rules regarding free speech. But on the question of free speech, it's more than one discourse among several. Understand academic free speech and we illuminate free speech generally. So to begin my opening remarks, I, that, now I'm beginning my opening remarks, in, in, case, in case you were expecting me now to wind down. Um, uh, I can't do short but I'm going to be economical. Um, our understanding of free speech as a value, its boundaries and character and so on, is not a constant. It doesn't change in every generation, but it does change. If we endeavor to distinguish between the present and the near past, between how things are and how things most recently were, no doubt many things will occur to us but I would isolate one distinction, one that relates to our experience of free speech as a value to be championed. Let me do that. How was it championed then, in the near past, and how now? It seems to me that then, so to speak, it was championed by efforts to enlarge speech boundaries. What could be said who could speak and with what authority and in what places and to what audiences. And this championing of enlargement was iteratively and over time, but with what felt at the time like a gathering momentum, it was successful. What could once only be whispered could now be spoken with confidence and in full voice. The hitherto silent were finding their voice and were being heard, 
topics that had been suppressed, forms of expression that had been prescribed, and so on, were released into the public realm. It was an affair most generally, this, this recent past period, of the overrunning of limitations with a view to redefining them, setting the parameters wider. And I can say because I'm that old, those were liberating, invigorating, exciting times. And now, not so invigorating, not so exciting. Instead, we experience, I, I suggest, a, a, a giddy, disorienting combination of two novel features on the question of free speech. First, the overrunning of boundaries has destroyed the very notion of a boundary. This is principally achieved through the internet. In part, it's a matter of content. Anything can be said about anything. Anything that can be imagined can be represented. And in part, and in consequence of this first aspect, there is the matter of sheer quantity, a quality, let us say, of inundation. Paradoxically, this threatens speech in two ways. First, it erases the distinction between the true and the false, the credible and the absurd, reality and fantasy. It's destructive of expertise, scientific authority, and so on. We do not know what to trust, whom to trust. And this is the, this is the, this is the point. And so we stop listening. The audience for speech is lost. And when there is no audience, speech itself fails. Second, the inundation of speech means both that sheer quantity puts in jeopardy the very singularity of individual speech acts. They don't stand out anymore in the same way that one might say lights would not stand out in a snowstorm. That's the first aspect in its complexity, in a complexity which is, uh, so to speak, worked out under the sign of paradox. The second feature is that notwithstanding this overrunning of boundaries, this erasing of all boundary, there is a new censoriousness which threatens not just the achievements of the recent past, but also what in the recent past, and indeed the not so recent past, was regarded as beyond attack. Indeed, was regarded as central to our political and cultural self-understanding. And to add to our perplexities, this censoriousness is commonly defended in the name of free speech. This or that must be excluded, suppressed, in order that X or Y may be freed into speech. Let me call these the, the two challenges to free speech in our times, or just the two challenges. The recent past was so much more comfortable a time. We knew where we stood. We were not trapped by paradoxes. The enemy stood plain in front of us. But now, 
we might say we have passed from limitations on free speech, which were overcome, to threats to free speech, which we struggle to overcome without destroying what we seek to defend. It is not surprising, therefore, that we find ourselves in a state of confusion and demoralization. Universities, in many respects, stand at the center of these difficulties. They are expected to address the two challenges. The burden falls most heavily on them. The burden falls most heavily on us. We must teach against the weight of inundation, insisting on value, on evidence, on the pursuit of true judgment. And we must resist the new censoriousness while not shirking that censoriousness's challenge to received understandings of free speech. In the United States, as I perceive it, the instinct in response to the challenges is to have recourse to what we might term a generalized First Amendment thinking not First Amendment jurisprudence in any developed sense, but rather the value which animates that jurisprudence, which might be expressed as the conviction that democratic self-government is impossible without free speech, and that to place limits on speech is thereby to imperil the national project. In no other nation, to my knowledge, does this conviction run so deep? It is moving and impressive, and it explains why the United States is still the world's exemplary liberal democracy. If liberal democracy were to fail here, it would be a catastrophe for the larger liberal democratic project, which could not be overcome. One could not say this, in respect of the failure of liberal democracy in any other nation. The common response then to any anti-speech, anti-free speech move by a university is to hold it to the same First Amendment standard as the state. The response to any anti-speech move by a party within the university, again, is to hold that party to the same First Amendment standard as the state. That is to insist, you may not suppress this speech, exclude this speaker, suppress this text. There is something to be said for this approach. Everyone understands the First Amendment. Everyone is in favor of limiting governmental constraints on free speech. And the analogy is persuasive because, and I, I apologize for using this rather regrettable jargon, but the, the woke threats to free speech do have coercive qualities that one associates in extreme cases, at any rate, with government acts of repression, certainly in their consequence. However, this common First Amendment invoking response has the limitation of being, in the end, only an analogy. And the woke threat is not the same as government repression of speech, not least because there are aspects of the threat which are indeed uncritically and dogmatically defensive of a certain kind of speech and resistant to the investigation of that speech. You know, my truth is you can't question or challenge what I say because I am speaking my truth. This ideology is partly repressive for sure, but also partly and however implausibly anti-repressive because it purports to resist critical investigation as itself repressive. It's because it is thus a combination of an attack on free speech and a notional defense of free speech 
that the analogy with government repression breaks down and I think leaves reliance or exclusive reliance on First Amendment reasoning somewhat um, irrelevant. So I think a better line of attack is a defense of the mission of the university. This, this, and this is what the university stands for. This is what the university exists to promote. Membership of the institution requires the acceptance, even if not immediately the enthusiastic adoption of that mission. The mission has been characterized by your own Martha Nussbaum as a pedagogic version of Socratic inquiry. And that is as good an account, certainly for the purposes of my remarks this afternoon, as we may find. And of course, it's an account which itself has a distinguished pedigree. In my own work, I have taken a related approach, though my own focus is less institutional and more discursive. It's a further alternative to the analogy with the First Amendment argument. In brief, I argue for two principles structuring our understanding of free speech. A system principle which disaggregates speech into distinct discourses and identifies the regulatory principles of each discourse. And an emancipation principle which identifies the values that the discourse champions and by implication the counter discourses that it opposes. Academic speech has its own regulatory principles and its own counter discourses. Fraudulent science is a violation of the system principle. Bogus science, Holocaust denial, climate change denial is a violation of the emancipation principle. It makes no sense to me that a university would dismiss a fraudulent scientist but defend a bogus scientist. Equally, equally. Suppression of texts, courses, etc., in the name of non-academic values or interests identity, religion, politics, and so on, are attacks on academic speech that must be resisted. Not in the name of free speech in general, whatever that is, but in the name of academic free speech, which it is the institutional duty of the university to uphold. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anthony. And uh, now we'll turn to Genevieve for a response. OK. Hi, everyone. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and to be in conversation. Uh, I work on the First Amendment and then the non-First Amendment free speech law in the United States. Um, and I haven't written specifically about academic freedom, because academic freedom is such the odd duckling in the family, I guess, which uh, Professor Julius's remarks, I think, help illuminate. It is clearly connected to the ordinary First Amendment and what we think of sort of ordinary free speech law, but it is a specific <laughs> and um, somewhat uncomfortable um, uh, body of law, body of theory, because I think, as Professor Julius was suggesting, so much of academic life is structured around the repression of speech, the discipline of speech, the control of speech. When I start my First Amendment class, the joke I always start with, you know, because you have to start with a joke, is, you know, this is a class about freedom of speech, but there's no freedom of speech in this classroom, <laughs> right? Uh, which is not to say that students don't get to have their own opinions and articulate them in class, but the warm of the class, the linguistic environment, which is a classroom, is a heavily structured uh, environment. It is not like the mass public sphere in which people get to speak at their will or not to speak, right? Uh, I am the dictator in many ways in the classroom. And so in many ways, uh, I guess I will say first that I agree with a lot of what uh, was just suggested to us, which is that we should have a, when we are thinking about freedom of speech, when we're thinking about academic freedom, have a much more disaggregated conception of what we're talking about that recognizes the distinctive institutions and forms in which speech occurs. And I think in general, this is true, I think for free speech discourse in general, 
I think it would be good if we move away from a natural rights kind of vocabulary in which there is just a right <laughs> that is God-given or democracy given that an individual possesses and recognize that there are functional democratic purposes that we are trying to effectuate by means of this language of rights and that that looks different and um, uh, takes a different form in different contexts. And so when we're regulating, I suppose I would disagree a little bit about there being sort of freedom of speech and then this uh, sort of political speech, say, or academic speech or religious speech, I think much more in terms of social institutions, maybe not surprisingly my training is in anthropology. So I think we can think about the regulation of the public sphere, which plays an incredibly important role in democratic life, but operates, looks different as a speech environment from an institution like the university, or an institution like a hospital, or an institution like a government. And all of those different institutions, we might think, uh, might have different rules. And so I agree with that takeaway. And I'll also agree that universities, as institutions that have specific and um, um, understandable but somewhat aberrant from a sort of ordinary First Amendment perspective, uh, speech rules, uh, that that institution is under pressure today. And I think everyone in this room probably feels it. Um, the autonomy, perhaps, uh, of the institution as a, as a learning institution seems threatened, uncertain. Tom and I talk a lot about the different um, forms of threats, both internal and external. I suppose I will disagree, though, in the, the diagnosis of the problem, and then push a little bit against the, I think, what you were suggesting in your remarks and suggested more in the, in the piece you just published about the solution or the approach that the university should take. OK, so disagree with the diagnosis. So I don't think that there is a threat to, I think you, were, um, you put it in rather um, metaphysical terms, a threat to speech itself in a way, brought about by the new technological affordances of a social media uh, mass public sphere. I think actually, maybe I'm an optimist here, I think freedom of speech, speech is alive and well. <laughs> um, I'm in general a big fan of the democratized public sphere that the social media and that the internet has enabled. And um, I guess I, I want to uh, ask more about the idea that there is, that speech itself is under threat because both there are no boundaries anymore and also there's so much speech that no speech matters. I think that was the suggestion from the beginning of your remarks. Okay, well, two responses, I suppose. So one is there are always boundaries. Again, this comes from uh, an anthropological perspective, but humans are um, pack animals. <laughs> we're, we're a social species. We organize ourselves around norms. And in every community, there will be boundaries, again, around which around what can be said and what cannot be said. There are, in this environment, too, things that I can credibly say here up on stage and things that I cannot. And I understand them, and you understand them, and perhaps everyone in the room understands them. Now, it is true that whereas uh, in an earlier period where there was much stricter gatekeeping around who could participate in the various, and again, I wanted to segregate, the various institutions of public life, perhaps the boundaries could be more taken for granted because they were more uniform. Because the people who were participating and the decision makers were more uh, agreed upon what the norms, what the in and the outs uh, could be. And one of the things I think that the sort of profound democratization of participation in mass public life has produced, and what this has done, I think it started with the mass public sphere and now is intruding on these other specialized institutions like the university, because of course we're also embedded to some degree in a public sphere environment. We're also public institutions. Uh, what that has done is that that has called into question the uniformity of these boundaries. And so there are a million different boundaries. If you're in a QAnon group, there are things you can say, things you cannot say. It'll look very different than you're, if you're in my favorite part of the internet, my uh, secret Facebook group, Academic Mamas, where are things you can say and things you cannot say. Like you cannot say your husband is babysitting the kids because you will get in big trouble because that's so sexist, you know? Um, so different speech norms in different environments, but there are absolutely boundaries on what is permissible and what is not permissible. They're just plural. Now, we may have questions about whether that is a good thing or a bad thing, but I want to push against the idea that there are no boundaries because I think that that denies, in fact, the actual operation of speech in many of these communities and the fact that even in the social media, there are contexts for speech. You know, one of the things that social media is often said to do is it uh, collapses contexts. So when you speak, you speak to a disaggregate, you speak to what looks like, you know, you may be speaking to your friends, but your your grandmother can see you, your professor can see you, and your employer 10 years down the line can see you, even though you're not thinking about them, right? And so there's no context. 
But of course, in the production of the speech, you are always imagining an audience. And so there is still a reciprocal relationship between a speaker and an audience that constrains and configures. Now, we might think that the porousness of these communities changes, makes speech dangerous. And I think it does. You know, when I ask my students about how they feel about social media, the primary word they respond, they, they say, one of the things they say is it's dangerous. It's dangerous because you can be harassed. It's dangerous because things stick around and they can be uh, viewed later. But it's dangerous, I think, in part because the speech is being produced in a, with the assumption that there are boundaries. You are in a particular kind of context. There are things that are OK to say, things that are not OK to say. And then that proves to be less certain than you imagine. Uh, but we still, you know, um, the, the concern you have about limitlessness of speech, I think, there's this opposite concern, and maybe this is uh, what your remarks pick up on, how there are, seem to be um, paradoxes or contradictions that pervade the public sphere. But you know, the concern I hear a lot is of an overly balkanized conversation, where there are too many um, uh, boundaries, both between different uh, speech communities, but also, I think, implicit there is between the norms. You know, what you can say to your Democratic friends looks very different than what you can say if you're in a sort of um, get out the vote Republican community. So I don't think that that's the problem with speech. I don't think that, that way there's a deep challenge to how speech operates. I think there are and always have been limits to what can be said. But the limits are more in question and maybe more um, uh, contestable than they have been. And I also don't think that because there's so much speech, speech has lost its audience. You know, I think, uh, in fact, one of the things that's so remarkable about our contemporary period is how powerful it has revealed speech to be. Individual tweets can move markets. They can threaten democracy. Uh, they can make you a million bucks if you're Kylie Jenner. Right? Like one of the things we're seeing is in how powerful, how dangerous, how important speech is. But not everyone's speech, the speech that attracts these mass audiences. And so there's a way in which you know, the, the job I have to do as a professor to, to students to make them think that freedom of speech is important because speech is important is much easier today because it's so obvious to everyone. And that's why I say, in some ways, freedom of speech or speech is alive and well. I think it's uh, so obvious to everyone, both the danger but also the power of speech. I think the reason that it feels so uncertain that we, there is a desire maybe to look back on the good old days. Everything feels like the center cannot hold. <laughs> um, is because these changes are challenging the existing institutional structures that organized public life. I think, uh, until recently, and continue to organize public life today, which is that the division between, uh, do, uh, so first of all, the demise of gatekeeping has meant, on the one hand, we have a much more democratized conversation, which I think is a good thing. But it also calls into question, I think, the unquestioned boundaries and what can be said. Um, do, is there too much democracy? Are there too many people participating? I think the sort of these glory days of um, the sort of the expansion of free speech seemed wonderful because uh, you know, who doesn't love more speech, uh, more expression, more democracy? And I think today the, the questions are much more complicated because uh, democratization has produced a lot of social um, disagreement, tension, uh, a threatening of democratic values itself. Um, I also do not think that that is inconsistent with the history of liberalism. <laughs> I think this is a feature of the history of liberalism, uh, but it produces a lot of discomfort. And then to get closer to the topic we're talking about today, I also think what has happened, though, is that, the, as you say, social media and the more democratized public sphere is calling into question the authority and the legitimacy of a whole set of knowledge institutions that have um, performed this incredibly important role in public life and in democratic functioning. And of course, the, the university is not the only one. I think we could think of the uh, challenging challenge of scientific institutions the deep state of government bureaucracy. All of these we might think of as different kinds of knowledge institutions that have their unique forms of uh, um, intellectual production that look quite different from the mass public sphere. And there I agree with you that the democratization of public discourse and the extent to which universities are themselves sort of susceptible to the, the um, attention of the public, of the new <clears throat> social media, you know, the ways in which what happens in the university um, it can be picked up. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, imperiled by too much attention from the outside world because what we do here looks different than uh, sort of um, the distinctiveness of the speech norms can uh, be challenged if they're too easily accessible to the outside. And so, you know, I think, yeah, this is just a practical concern with academic freedom that I think we should talk a lot more about than maybe we do. You know, during COVID, things went on Zoom. 
uh, the Zoom lectures were videotaped so that students could access them. Uh, and then after COVID, there's now this question, do we continue to videotape our lectures? So you might think ordinary speech principles say you continue to videotape the lectures because it makes it easier for students to access. It increases the feasibility of the expression. I worry a lot about um, uh, students who are parents, students who have care responsibilities, who maybe can't make class. I want them to be able to see my lectures. But of course, videotaping lectures means that they can be put on, the, on social media. And so the boundary between the, the distinctive speech community that is the university and this other thing, which is the mass public sphere, starts to break down. Uh, and so I think it is, I agree with you, it is placing um, a, a pressure uh, on the um, forms of um, uh, knowledge production, which is the university. And I agree also that the university should not and never has, in fact, in the United States as elsewhere, abided by ordinary First Amendment principles. But it's not wholly outside of these First Amendment principles because I think there is a central insight of the modern First Amendment that also applies when we're talking about academic freedom. And the central insight is the um, sort of this questioning of the, um, uh, the correctness of the decision maker, right? this sort of uh, epistemological uncertainty, uh, I call it, which is that at any given moment, you may think certain speech is good, certain speech is, is bad, certain speech is valuable to the ends you wanted to advance, and certain speech is not. But you might be wrong. Right? There was this, uh, from the beginning of the, certainly the First Amendment cases, this questioning of our received knowledge about what should be within and what should be without, which leads to a desire to um, allow there to be speech that is objectionable, speech that we disagree with, speech that we dislike. And so I suppose the question I would have for you in, um, in when we're thinking about academic freedom in the university and the effort to say, look, let's not apply ordinary First Amendment principles here and just say everyone gets to say what they want, right? Because that's obviously antithetical to how university, I mean, it would be chaos. Like, you could not have a university in which we have the principles of speech that apply when the government regulates the mass public sphere in the university. Um, I completely agree. But this question about how do you decide what's fraud, or what's bad science, or what's wrong science, and how do you know you're not wrong, is the same question, I think, that um, pushes in when we talk about the First Amendment context us to be very skeptical of government efforts to say, you know, let's get rid of all the um, COVID-denying speech or whatever it may be. And so I think raises really interesting and difficult, but I guess institutional questions, decision-making questions, practical questions about if we do recognize that we might be wrong and that in fact, universities are great knowledge producers, but they're also repositories of power and authority and have often um, you know, been uh, guilty of their own forms of gatekeeping. Um, how do we honor the distinctiveness of the university as a particular form of knowledge production while recognizing also that the decision makers might be completely wrong and we would like to have um, as open an environment as possible? Should, I respond, to, should yes. I respond to that? I want to resist the impulse to disagree. Not because I find that but because I think that there's a certain kind of performative aspect to these events where one f finds oneself taking a more extreme position simply for the sake of the adversarial jousting. And I, so I don't, I don't want to argue against what I might, were I to be jousting, describe as a somewhat Panglossian view of current state of affairs by taking some desperately negative and doomsaying view I don't think everything is awful. I don't think everything is great. I, I somewhat resist the use of the word democratization um, because there's implicit in it a kind of endorsement um, when one talks about the enlargement of speech as the democratization of speech, I don't think that enlargement necessarily carries with it that endorsement unless it's actually argued for. I don't find that the enlargement of speech on the internet um, uh, amounts to a greater democratization. Uh, on the contrary, uh, for two reasons, which I would like to come to now, um, in some respects, but I think probably uh, we, we agree on this, that uh, certain uses of the internet have had profoundly anti-democratic um, implications, not least the organization of an insurrection on the 6th of January. So, so um, 
we have to be careful about using raw words like democratization when we're describing what I think would be better described, at least initially in more neutral terms, the enlargement of discursive opportunities that the internet has presented. On the question of, on the anthropological question of um, boundaries, the, 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 so to speak, premise of anthropological inquiry being that there are determinate communities and every community has its boundaries, I think that doesn't quite register the transformative impact of the internet. And it's a transformative impact which works in two different and contradictory directions one of which you identified, the other of which I think you overlook. The direction that you identified is in the creation of echo chambers, so that, or silo or balkanization, so that instead of a community, as we would ordinarily understand a community, with a boundary diversity of view, you have micro communities in which there is essentially no diversity. Where, where people simply are endlessly approving thumbs up, hearts, likes, what's being said by other people. Um, but then, I, just, I want to know. Should I give way? No, no, no. Go, go, go. <laughs> I'm very happy to give way. I'm very happy, as we say in British parliamentary terms, to take a point of order. <laughs> I just want to know which part of the internet you're on, really, with all the hearts and well, likes. But anyway, let's go back to one that. that we don't, an echo really chamber don't. that we don't share <laughs> because, because you're disagreeing with me. Um, um, yes. Um, I mean, I can think of at least one WhatsApp group um, in, which, in which if one said anything other than uh, one's own child and the children of everyone else on the group is, a geni is anything other than a genius, one would find oneself immediately excluded. <laughs> but that's, I'm simply speaking from my own experience as a, as a parent on a, family, on a school WhatsApp group. But um, there are other and, dare I say, more pernicious instances than that. But the, 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 the counter to these micro communities in which so far from there being boundaries, there is, so to speak, a single line that one has to walk, in which there is no diversity, is the utter absence of any boundaried sense of a community which the internet itself represents. I think it's simply a misunderstanding of the transformative impact of the internet to think about it as merely an instrument of existing communities. Its effect is to reconstitute existing communities as unbounded aggregates. And the impact of this unbounded aggregation in combination with the creation of micro communities, I think puts to bed once and for all, in the sense of brings to an end once and for all, any notion that one can, so to speak, domesticate um, the internet and one's understanding of the internet as essentially about the democratization of speech. So that, that's the point, point I make about that. On the specific subject of inundation, I claim absolutely no originality uh, when it comes to the points that I'm making. I'm, I'm, I'm reliant on the scholarship of Timothy Wu, um, who in a number of very interesting articles points to um, the, the phenomenon of inundation as a totalitarian t tool of control. And he makes the point um, that um, um, hitherto, the way in which totalitarian societies controlled speech was to censor speech. Now, he says, it's the opposite. Um, what happens is that in China, for example, I mean, well, there's plenty of ordinary censorship in China, but, um, but in addition, and so to speak, at the opposite end of the censoring activity, there is instead an inundation. So, say for example, um, uh, uh, there is a report of a fire in a factory. And the suggestion is that the reason there was a fire is because of a lack of proper health and safety conditions or that the, the local political chief was in charge of it and he wasn't paying attention to it or whatever. Some, some news item which is attached to some piece of political or social criticism. The way in which that now tends to be dealt with is, is that there is this surge of 
contrary information. No, it wasn't a fire, it was a this. Uh, no, it wasn't this person who was responsible, it was that. Troubling questions are asked about, was there really a fire? Was it perhaps a fake news? Um, uh, was, the, was the video contrived? So that, so that actually, um, uh, uh, any exposure to the general question of what happened leaves the audience in a state of utter bewilderment. And that bewilderment, which of course induces a certain passivity, because if one doesn't know what's happened, one can't act on the knowledge of what has happened. And that bewilderment, um, in its censoring impact, is at least as effective as the mere suppression of the news itself of the fire in the factory. And that is what, among other vices, um, the internet has enabled. This fantasy in the 1990s and the 2000s that the internet would put paid to totalitarianism has been exposed as precisely that, a fantasy. And we must be alive to this rather than speaking about democratization as the, so to speak, the outcome of the internet. So that's, that's a kind of general observation I have to make. Um, uh, Genevieve on, on what you said. I wonder whether I, I should pause at this point. I've got other things to say, but I've already been speaking for two well, minutes. Well, I'm, oh, I'm sure that Genevieve would like to say something, and I'd also like to enlarge the discursive <laughs> opportunities in the room if... Uh, if exactly. So. Genevieve, why don't... Uh, do you, uh, Just a quick response to that last point, which is not to deny that this is a problem, but, you know, your account of inundation, it sounded to me very similar to Hannah Arendt's account of totalitarian forms of... Uh, power by forcing um, members of a, a totalitarian society to, um, um, I guess I'll say, by disseminating uh, falsities that were, uh, uh, that everyone kind of suspected to be false and requiring citizens of the society to go along with untruths or to not know, uh, to, uh, what does she say, um, give up the possibility of knowing the truth. And I think also of Lisa Wedeen's work on Syria, which is to say, I don't disagree with the account of the phenomenon. I just, I'm skeptical about how novel it is. Now, maybe the internet, because it lowers the cost of um, speech in general, <laughs> makes it easy for totalitarian actors to, or repressive actors, to use it to their ends. But also, of course, the China example suggests and the sheer uh, enormous amount of uh, worry there is about repressing pro-democratic speech suggests that in, you know, the valences of the internet go both ways. <laughs> so it can be used for repressive and totalitarian ends. It can be used to push people to doubt all reality. And it is also a really incredibly powerful tool for resistance against that. And so for sure, uh, I guess I didn't mean to come off as Panglossian. I don't think that the internet is going to solve all our problems. I'm not a techno idealist. But I also don't think it um, fundamentally uh, sort of transforms speech either. And it may profoundly affect our community, uh, so the, create, the way in which we create communities, but you know, that also has constantly changing um, as material conditions and um, um, uh, uh, knowledge, uh, forms of communication change themselves. Anyway, all of which is to say, correct, inundation is a real problem, but is it such a new problem? With your permission, I'll... Uh, open it up to the audience and see if we have questions or, or comments from the floor. And if you raise your hand, I'll call for the uh, mic to be uh, sent. So at the back row there, if we could. Good evening. I am of the belief that with every freedom comes responsibility. Language is a form of expression. I agree with the statement structuring and understanding of free speech is important. I also believe structuring and understanding of academic freedom is crucial to sustain the dignity 
of diversity. I think I heard the statement that institutions are repositories of power and um, authority. Where does censorship, culture, reciprocity play a role? I wrote this down. <laughs> In the development, operation, and dignity of difference in a democracy. Um, I take a couple more and then turn to the word. Is it? Uh, yes, in the, in the middle here. Thank you both. Uh, a question for either of our speakers to address. Um, when we talk about kind of online speech and the ways it's changed in the past few years, I think our minds pretty quickly go to Twitter and Facebook, right? Uh, you know, Facebook groups, disinformation, around a couple of big uh, UK and US elections in 2016, obviously the many things that have gone on with Twitter. I think one thing that gets overlooked probably because it's private by design is like workplace Slack channels. So I'm curious about your perspective on the way that people have been hounded by coworkers, occasionally run out of town on a rail from their workplaces, especially journalistic establishments. What's your perspective on Slack and free speech? Maybe one more. Yes, sir. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the responsibility that some of the phenomenon you're describing put on the audience for the speech. Um, I mean, sort of the, the classic um, context of the First Amendment and the Constitution was um, a community of people who thought that virtue in the citizenry was a critical element um, that was needed for the kind of institutions they were describing to function. And I'm wondering if um, that theme is something that kind of the internet events that you're describing highlight in ways that um, create particular challenges for, uh, for all of us around here. Anthony, would you like to take any of those? Or um, Yes, I'd like to address the first question, actually, because I, um, I, mean, I, I don't have anything to say about Slack channels and workplace. Um, I mean, I've heard people are horrible to people, and people have been horrible to other people since people started coexisting. And workspaces can be, as we know, a terribly toxic environments. And that needs to be regulated for the sake of everyone's sanity and equilibrium. And so I have no difficulty at all. I mean, certainly in my own law firm, everything that is uh, said in passing between colleagues is available for inspection. And so if there is, God forbid, any bullying or worse, it's immediately transparent or certainly available. Um, and I think very correctly is policed. So, I mean, that's what I have to say about that. But can I just address this question of respect for diversity? Because I think it's in the, in the five and a half hour version of my opening remarks, <laughs> which, is, which is, you know, you'll be, everyone will be relieved to hear, um, it did not survive the first edit. But in the five and a half hour version, um, I had uh, actually what I thought was quite an interesting piece of uh, uh, academic historical analysis of the emergence of the Jewish Studies Department. Because I, it just happens to be something that I'm interested in, um, but partly because of my academic work, partly because of my own ethnicity, um, uh, and uh, for other more personal reasons that are of no interest or consequence here. I'm interested in the emergence of Jewish studies departments in universities and in what that might tell us about respect for diversity. Um, and what was very interesting to me was, first of all, how difficult it was for Jewish studies departments to get up going and, and to be accepted inside universities and how very much the pressure for Jewish studies departments came from Jews who felt that the accounts that were being given of the Jewish scriptures were essentially accounts which were written, although ostensibly from an academic perspective, a neutral academic perspective, actually were saturated in Christian 
supersessionist preconceptions. That, that Judaism represented a more primitive version of monotheism which perfected itself, certainly in the northern German universities, in a kind of utterly spiritualized Protestantism. And this just utter sense of exasperation for the first generations of Jews post-emancipation in the second quarter of the 19th century, that the, 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 the Hebrew scriptures and the whole rabbinic tradition of investigation of the scriptures and the Talmud and all the rest of it um, was, so to speak, the plaything of lightly secularized Christian scholars. It was unbearable. I mean, I'm one, I'm one, and reading the first and second generation of, of German Jewish academics, because the whole thing started in Germany, um, and that sense of frustration, and then the exhilaration when the first faculties were, were opened and the first scholarships started being generated, and the kind of um, um, gratitude to the university institutions for allowing Jews in. It's, it's a fasc fascinating story, and fully three quarters of, my, of an hour of my five and a half presentation was an investigation. But I'm so happy that the lady at the back has raised this, because it allows me just to say that it seems to me that the proper way to respect the dignity of diversity is to allow that kind of activity to flourish. And by parity of reasoning, of course, Black studies, women's studies, whatever. Um, because the challenge to the preconceptions um, of scholars who uh, perfectly correctly and properly do not allow their own identities to limit the range of their investigations, that challenge also needs to be heard. So having said that, let me also say there is no academic principle, freestanding principle, which, which respects the dignity of diversity of opinions. Because the academic commitment to truth in the end will trump, forgive the use of the word, will trump um, mere respect for diversity. And that's, if you like, the, the counter or companion proposition to the first one that I made. I hope that's a satisfactory response. Genevieve, do you want to uh, comment on this? Add to that because I think that's so interesting, uh, and I agree. But I also think it points to some of the sort of what we were talking about earlier, which is this question about gatekeeping, the extent to which we want it. So, if we think that it is very important for the functioning of the university that it be to a certain degree closed off from outside pressures, that it uh, produce and develop its own standards, right? Because mm. you don't want the standards of academic production to be the same as the public sphere and political standards are different, as you said correctly, from the standards that apply in class for tenure purposes for academic production. So what we're calling for is a certain amount of gatekeeping, a closing of the horizon in order to maintain <clears throat> standards. There is this danger and I think universities have experiences over time where there is internal disagreement <laughs> about the range of, for example, potential, uh, as your historical example suggests, about yes. what are the proper topics of study, who are the proper students, who are the people who can populate. And so I do think that there is this in irresolvable tension between openness and closeness. As you say, right, in the article, there are para communities that are not housed in the institution, and I think actually today a lot of them live on Twitter. <laughs> that are pushing and undermining and threatening and challenging the existing norms and forms of academic inquiry to great effect. And I think in the last 20 years, one of those challenges has been to the lack of um, racial, sexual orientation, yes. um, uh, citizenship diversity, and perspectives and conversation at, uh, for example, elite institutions. And that seems to me all to the good, but it creates this tension between openness and closeness, cl closedness. Can I just quickly respond to that? Is that allowed? Please, please. Yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> I. Well, it's our event. No. <laughs> Making the rules. No, but I'm a guest here, and I mean, one mustn't, you know, one has to <laughs> exercise restraint. There are boundaries. Uh, well, uh, indeed. <laughs> um, 
What I wanted to say about that was, I, because this is a point that's been made, and it's been made several times in conversations I've had over the last three or four days, this question of, well, it's all very well to say that um, academic speech should be more circumscribed than political speech, but, and then this is the regarded as the killer objection, who's to say who should be given the power to police it. And, and then, so to speak, the person who makes that point sits back, like you're sitting back now, as if to say, <laughs> take that, you know? That's <laughs> like, and you know, what the, the response that's invited is a kind of slack-jawed acknowledgement that that is a decisive response. But of course, <laughs> the truth is, allow me to say sitting forward, the, tr the <laughs> truth is that if we were to say, and this is why context and discourse specific analysis is so important, the context is everything. If we were to say, for example, of a criminal justice system, we can't possibly prosecute people for crimes because what would happen if they went to a judge and an innocent person was, a, was uh, convicted? We can't bear the prospect of the conviction of an innocent person and therefore we will dismantle our entire criminal justice system. We can't bear the prospect that an, a good academic would be excluded from a university by a wrong decision by gatekeepers and therefore we cannot have gatekeepers. Now obviously no sensible person other than a kind of demented anarchist um, in other words, no sensible person would say that of the criminal justice system. But the readiness of our ability to, tr to say it, and not just to say it, but to treat it as some decisive um, objection to gatekeeping in the universities, because gatekeepers can make mistakes, therefore we cannot have gatekeepers, that makes no sense to me at all, is my answer. <laughs> Do either of you think hearers have responsibilities? Last question. That we had. Who has responsibilities? The question that we got from the gentleman there, that, 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 uh, that audiences now have new responsibilities. So what, what, what can we say about that in our speech inundated world, whether they're bounded properly or not, we, what are the responsibilities or the ethics of listeners? I want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> okay, well, I'll see when, and then I, can I respond to it? Oh, I'm sorry, I interrupted uh, interrupt the discourse. Because well, I think the analogy actually, so okay, before we yeah, get there, please. since it is our role, our, yeah. no, yeah, you got it. The ours, ours forward. Um, so I think the analogy is a really interesting one, both because I think there are many sensible people in the United States, at least, who think that there is serious problems with our criminal justice system. Of course. And that the um, incarcerate, mass incarceration does call into question the legitimacy of the entire system. But leaving, leaving that aside, let's not go there today. We've touched on enough <laughs> uh, touchy topics. You know, we might think, and I don't think I was saying, because there are these questions about who gets to decide, we should stop having any gatekeeping at all. Um, as students in my class know, there's plenty of gatekeeping <laughs> that occurs. But I do think it suggests that we should think very carefully about institutional design, and the analogy is a fantastic one. So for example, you know, we might say, yes, uh, sometimes innocent people will be put in jail, and that's very bad, but we should still prosecute. But we might also say, but let's think about how we design the office of the prosecutor. You know, so there are very uh, well-articulated uh, critiques that I'm sympathetic to that the amount of non-transparency, the amount of prosecutorial discretion, including prosecutorial immunity from the ordinary norms of transparency and publicity that otherwise organize democratic society, <laughs> very problematic because they allow all kinds of bad behavior to occur without any kind of uh, political or democratic accountability. And so you might say, okay, so sure, <laughs> there needs to be decision making, but we need to think about the conditions under which that decision making occurs. Yeah. I think for the university as well, I think there are many questions about the ways in which decision making occurs, who gets to make the decision, that are separate from the question of should we have decision making at all. I didn't mean to suggest the latter, but I did I, mean to I, suggest I completely that. agree with you. And I think you. the challenge to the existing, the challenge we've seen coming both internally and externally about diversity, about openness to external views that are um, over the last 20 years in the American university, I think has been productive. And I think we should read it as a question of institutional design to some degree. How are we going to design our institutions that we are both producing um, intellectually credible work according to the standards that we have? And we're not excluding uh, unnecessarily lots of different. 
services. On the responsibilities of listeners, I guess I'll just say, um, you know, uh, Brandeis, uh, uh, famous uh, Justice Brandeis in the early 20th century has this really famous concurrence in this uh, Fifth Amendment case uh, called Whitney v. California. It's a concurrence, not a dissent, so it's kind of it's a complicated opinion. We don't need to go there. But, um, but in which he says, you know, uh, free speech only really works, the First Amendment only works if we are going to be brave and courageous listeners, essentially. That in order to participate in the hurly-burly of public life as the First Amendment blesses it, you have to be brave and you have to be courageous. And on the one hand, for damn sure, right? Like it, it's awful to hear people who disagree with you. It, it's horrible. You have to stick to your guns. There are certain kinds of emotional affects that that has. And we might think that being a member of a democratic society does require you to have certain kinds of capabilities and capacities, or at least want to develop them. But I also think it's overstated. You know, that there's a particular conception of courage that is very insensitive to the ways in which people are differently positioned in these debates. And so to simply say, oh, just be, be tough, be courageous, when um, you are in debates that make it incredibly difficult for you to participate or to speak, I think is um, sort of an, in, uh, uh, an, an ins unsatisfactory response. So I do think we have to think about how we listen. And, and I also think, as universities, one of our jobs is to teach students how to be good listeners. It's, not just a thing that you do when you, listen, you know, there's a difference between hearing and listening. Um, but I also think it can be overstated. I feel like listening to you, we have a whole agenda going forward of things to inquire into and oh, we to do. debate and, <laughs> and, and wrestle over. Uh, and I'm afraid we're out of time already. So uh, please join me in thanking Genevieve. <laughs> And I would just add that there is a reception outside. Please join us and uh, continue the conversation. Thank you so much.